I'm Jeff Richards with Bluffton High School in Bluffton, Ohio. I'm here today to talk about the Flexbone Triple Option, specifically the inside veer, which is kind of the cornerstone or staple of what we do. Uh, first things first, I want to thank Coach Banstra for uh, setting all this up. I think it's amazing that in the situation we're in, it gives a lot of coaches a platform and then uh, a lot of resources to improve ourselves as we go. Um, as we go here, I want to give you a little bit of background about myself. Um, I am the head coach of Bluffton High School, but I'm also an alum. Uh, I played from 2000 to 2003 under head coach Dennis Lee. Uh, offensively, we were a double tight wishbone team forever. Basically, the entire 90s into the early 2000s, Bluffton was known as a wishbone team. In 2003, which was my senior year, we switched to being a spread team. We were blessed with a lot of talent. Uh, that kind of dictated that. And we were always a 4-4 defense. From 04 to 07, I played at Bluffton University under head coach Greg Brooks. Ran a pro-style offense, 4-3 defense. Um, and then I got into coaching a uh, year after I graduated. And I had the, the fortune of being taken on as the tight ends coach and the JV offensive coordinator at Bluffton University under head coach Tyson Veit. Uh Coach Veit's now at Iowa State, having a ton of sec success with Coach Campbell there. We ran kind of a multiple formation offense there, a lot of West Coast principles, um, and we were in Coach Veit, uh being that he came from uh, Rich Rodriguez in uh, West Virginia, was an odd stack guy in defense. Uh, I moved with my family in 2011, and we relocated down to Louisville, Kentucky, uh, I had the opportunity from 2012 to 2014 to coach at DuPont Manual High School, which if you're aware of, of uh, the state of Kentucky, uh, Manual is one of the biggest and most successful uh, of the big schools down there. I coached under Dr. Oliver Lucas, a phenomenal coach, a uh, former uh, coach at the University of Colorado back when Coach McCarthy was there in the 80s and early 90s. Uh, we ran a variation of a West Coast offense, uh, a lot of ISO principles in the run game. And our defense was extremely good as a 3-4 defense. Uh, 2015, I relocated back up to my hometown of Bluffton, and I was the head wrestling coach at Bath High School in Lima for a year. Had a great, a great experience there. And then in 2016, I was named as the head coach at Bluffton High School. Um, right now, we are flexbone offense uh, since 2017, and we run a 4-2-5 defense. A little information about Bluffton High School. We are in OHSAA's Division VI, uh, a smaller school. We're in the Northwest Conference. There are eight teams in our conference. It's an interesting conference dynamic. Uh, we have some Division V teams and all the way down to Division VII teams. So the size of the schools is very diverse. The average roster size, you're looking between 30 and 50 players. We at Bluffton have been between 30 and 35 to 40 uh, over the past four years. We compete against all different types of offenses and defenses. Um, the air raid has really been picking up in our league. There are a few teams that do that. The wing T has been a power in the Northwest Conference for a number of years. Uh, one of the teams that has won the conference every single year for the past eight years has been a wing T teams. Uh, we've had a three-way tie for the conference title in 2019 and 2018, but the wing T is still a force that we have to deal with in the NWC. The power eyes is, is in the league, the wishbone, pro-style offenses, and then you've got those mix of multiple looks and things like that. Defensively, we see just about everything. 4-3, four, 4-4, four, four, Five two, five three, odd stack, uh, the three four look. If you don't want to consider it a five two, um, so the great thing about our conference is it's very exciting with matchups and how teams uh, run into each other uh, with schemes. It's a great league for coaches. Uh, in 2016, when I took over, uh, the team itself was, was a five wide spread team. In 2015 and before that, they graduated. 14 seniors who all started. So they lost just about everyone with the exception of about four guys who were very, very talented young men. We were a pro style offense in 2016. We only averaged 212 yards per game, nine first downs per game. 
offensively, it was a very big struggle for us. The reason for that, offensive line-wise, we were so small. Our average offensive line size was between 160 and 170 pounds. Uh, I have actually a very good running back who graduated as a senior his sophomore year, which was 2016. He had to play on the offensive line for us just based on he was bigger and stronger than anybody else we had, and he wasn't fitting in at running back at that point. 2017, we switched to the, the flex bone triple option style offense. Uh, we have had tremendous success in our offense efficiency and production. Like it says, they're 272 yards per game and then 11 first downs per game. A lot of the stock we put in our offense is moving the chains. If you look, we've progressed in first downs per game. 2018, I can say our biggest Achilles heel was turnovers. We had 21 turnovers that season, which is why you see that dip in yards per game. However, this past year, uh, 2019, 296 yards per game, 15 first downs per game. We also broke our school's single game scoring record, scoring 70 points in a game. Uh, nine school single game, single season records have been set since 2017. That is due to kids buying into our offensive system, as well as being blessed with some skill position guys and some hardworking offensive line guys who really, really give us that opportunity to success. On a personal note, as a head coach, I always pride myself in developing quality young men. Uh, our team has been academic all Ohio since 2017, three years in a row. Our team GPA hovers right around a 3.4 to 3.5. And that's not just varsity, that's across the board. Everybody on our team, very, very strong students, which, which I am thrilled to brag about whenever I get that opportunity. Um, we have key values, basically, these six things are what we, we hang our hat on that. If we're going to win, these are the reasons we're going to win. The first one, be the tougher team. We want to be the most fundamentally sound team. We want to follow the seven essentials. Now, with these seven things, what it is is basically these are the things we believe. You do these seven things, you're going to win every game. Win the turnover margin, run the ball and stop the run, win the kicking game, win on third down, create big plays and limit negative yardage plays, win at the goal line, and then eliminate foolish penalties and missed assignments. With that, and a self-reflection moment with that, the thing you can always improve on and the thing that you always look at, third down. Third down is something that if you can win third down just about every time, you're going to win the game. Playing together, playing with superior effort, and the last key value is something we, we emphasize greatly to our players, and that's don't flinch. What that basically means is we spend a week setting a plan up. If at the first time of sign of adversity, we flinch and try to change our plans just because something didn't go 100% correct, we're flinching. We're, we're, we're cashing in our chips and we're not sticking to our game plan. We want to stay as focused on what our job is and what we're supposed to do at all times. And that's not just on the football field, that's in life. We tell our guys they need to be committed and hold themselves accountable no matter what they do. We have weekly goals. We do award stickers every week. Uh, one of our goals is to score 21 points on offense. This past year, we scored 24 points per game, which is an improvement over the past four years, uh, much, much better. Averaging five yards per carry rushing. It used to be we'd have a set number of yards. We would say have 200 yards rushing. Well, we're a rush. We're a run-based offense. We're going to hit 200 yards rushing probably just about every time. But if our yards per carry isn't what we want, we don't deserve that sticker. And then also in the pass game, averaging nine yards per pass completion. If I set up a goal that I want my guys to pass for 200 yards in a game where we may only throw it five times based on what we do, we're not going to hit 200 yards. The nine yards per completion gives us that goal of when we throw the ball, we're going to burn the defense and make them pay for not honoring the pass. Ten plays of 15 yards or more, we call these our explosive plays. This is the biggest determining factor we've found with uh, success. If we can have more explosive plays, we are going to be very, very successful. And then 75% third down efficiency is a goal. That's a tough one to get if you think about three out of every four times on third down being successful. Uh, that's a battle to get. And then zero turnovers, which should be a goal for every single team. 
to never put the ball on the ground. I will say with the offense we run, you're going to risk turnovers just based on it's a little bit dangerous to pitch the ball mid-play. Why do we run the flexbone triple option? There are a few reasons that I think make the flexbone triple option one of the most dangerous offenses in existence. The first one is you get your best athletes and players on the field. A lot of your skill position players are basketball players. If you think of it as a three-on-two fast break, that's what we run. The inside veer, which is the base of our offense, is just like a three-on-two fast break in basketball. If you put that in the, the kids' minds, they understand how fast moving it is, how athletic it is, and it gives your guys that are good in space, it gives them that opportunity to excel. It can be a nightmare to defend for defensive coordinators and teams if they're not disciplined or if they're unfamiliar with the offense. You don't see the flex bone very often. You don't see it every week. I can see the air raid four weeks in a row, but the flex bone triple option, when it shows up, you've got about four days to prepare for it. And if your kids aren't used to seeing it and they're not disciplined, they're going to struggle greatly. Um, one of our team's favorite things to do is to run just our base play inside veer repeatedly against a team who does not know how to stop it. Currently in the past three years, our best performance with it, we ran inside veer uh, 16 consecutive times without uh, having a play where we didn't gain yardage. Uh, and that was something our kids loved because they knew what we were doing. We were just running tempo with it. We also have 12 possible variations of the option. Now that doesn't mean we have 12 different options. What it has is it's a wrinkle. We have an adjustment, a formational alignment, something like that, that for our guys, it doesn't change much, but for the defense, it puts in an increased amount of stress on what they have to do, especially if they haven't prepared for it. This offense eliminates the need to block every play side defender. One of the greatest things about this offense is that we don't block everybody. So it gives us a numbers advantage with who we're blocking. Time management and efficiency uh, with the triple option, you can actually wear down the clock to where the team you're playing against loses two or three possessions per game. That doesn't seem incredibly large, but in a game where you're scoring a lot or not scoring very much at all, every possession matters. And then this is the ultimate team-based offense. I have yet to see another offense where every player's job is clearly defined and where every single block, every single pitch, every single read is as important as the triple option. Paul Johnson is considered, you could say, the godfather of the flex bone triple option. Um, he was the head coach at Georgia Tech for a number of years. He just recently retired. Um, our triple option is based off of the Georgia Tech. Uh, I was fortunate enough to, to develop a bit of a, a professional relationship communicating with Mike Seawalk and Paul Hamilton, who were assistants under Coach Johnson uh, at Georgia Tech. I would go down to Georgia Tech and meet with those two guys uh, and learn how they run their offense. Uh, Paul Johnson uh, was the most uh, dedicated to the triple option you're going to find. Uh, he, he, he built the offense basically. Um, and he's been, he's, you look at his track record, you can search how successful he's been. Uh, the guy himself is a legendary coach and the offense treated him very, very well. And it is very successful still to this day. Uh, if you look for the triple option, you're going to see army, Navy, air force, the Citadel, Kennesaw state, those schools have Paul Johnson influences. But then if you branch out, RPOs are basically a, an extension of the triple option. Uh, you look at teams like Ferris State and Division II who runs the spread option and do some things like that. It's all based in, in triple option principles, and they run the inside beer out of what they do. So Paul Johnson's a guy that kind of we've based what we do on him. Our flex bone, so getting into what we do here. Uh, it's commonly known as the flex bone triple option. In reality, what we do, it's a system. It's not plays. Uh, when you get into calling plays, you get those people that play Madden and they run one play over and over and over again. That's not what this offense is. A system is structured so that if one thing is not there, there's another thing available. 
Um, every play, our quarterback has the option to check opposite, and we also have an audible to a different play. So based on the defense, we should always have a good play. This minimizes that potential for negative play. We always tell our quarterback we would rather that the uh, offense have a no-gain play than lose yardage. Now, does that always happen? No. But the goal is we should never have a negative play in any game. The base of our offense is the flex formation, which you see below here. Um, we use it this way. We have two receivers. We have two A backs, a B back, which would be considered like a fullback, and our quarterback. We don't tag them X, Y, Z, things like that. We have left receiver and we have right receiver. We have left A and we have right A. This way, because we're at a small school, we have 33 kids on our roster. If I have an injury and I need my right A to play left A, if he isn't experienced with that, it could cause a problem. But the good thing is our kids understand their role no matter what side they're on, so we can plug them in where they need to be. The Anvil Squad, also known as the offensive line. Anvil to us means aggressive, nasty, versatile, intense linemen. Basically, our offensive line is the pulse of everything we're doing. We have specific traits we look for with our offensive linemen. It doesn't always stay consistent. Every so often, you're going to get a lineman that, for some reason, he just fits better at tackle than he would at guard. Uh, but basically what we're looking for, the center is the leader of the unit. It needs to be your best offensive lineman. This is a guy who's going to have to snap the ball and block a nose guard. 90% of the time, our center is seeing a nose guard head up or shaded, trying to blow up the center. With this offense, it's so run-based. You're going to have teams that think the best thing to do is to try to blow up the center. Um, so you want to have your strongest blocker and your smartest blocker to be at that position. The guards, these are your bigger guys. These are your guys that can roll people up. You also want guys that have the ability to pull if need be. I would say our two next best plays outside of the inside fear are trap and then belly G where we're pulling the play side guard to kick out. And then our tackles, they're more of your utility type linemen. They can do just about anything. We've had undersized guys do very, very well on the offensive line. Two years ago, we actually had uh, our school's 100-meter dash runner playing on the offensive line at offensive tackle. He couldn't catch, but he could come off the ball and block, so he ended up in that position. The tackles need to be good at double teams and being able to understand who they should and should not block because we purposely do not block. The inside veer. Now, this is getting into the bulk of what I'm going to present on tonight. The triple option, as, it, as it's commonly known as, really is, is the inside veer. This is nothing groundbreaking or new. They've been doing the inside veer for decades. Um, it started with the wishbone and, and expanded from there. You look back in Nebraska when they had their great run. Uh, they were running the inside veer out of the I formation. Uh, you've had teams running the inside veer out of the gun. The flex bone is just where it's made its home recently, and, and it's had its extreme success. Basically what it is, is we are purposely not blocking two defenders. The first one is the guy who we would call the givery. That guy we are not blocking because we want him to make a choice whether or not to tackle the fullback or the quarterback. Based on his decision, he's going to be wrong. It doesn't matter what he chooses. Based on what he does, we're going to do something opposite. The second read man is the pitch key. He's going to be wrong no matter what he does. If he takes the pitch man, the quarterback will keep it. If he takes the quarterback, the quarterback will pitch it. We also have a guy we identify as number three, which is the run support player. This offense is very, very detailed to execution. If you want to run the triple option offense, you have to commit wholeheartedly to it. You can't just throw it in like a passing concept you want to try out. The triple option must be practiced daily, and it is not an easy offense to learn. But once it is established, it is very effective. 
the counting defenders, which I just cited, we, we count them as number one, number two, and number three to the play side. Number one is that first play side defender on or outside the play side tackle. We don't block it ever. He's the give, keep, read for our quarterback. Now, it seems simple, but if you put it in the, in the shoes of that defender, he's not getting blocked and his job is to take on a, a blocker. So it causes a conflict there. And then also he has to make a choice. We're dealing with teenagers. Making a choice in a split second puts a lot of stress on those young men. So this is great for the offense because you're forcing this young man to make a choice whether to tackle the guy who he thinks has the ball or another guy he thinks has the ball. Either way, he should be wrong. Number two is the next defender on or outside that play side tackle. He's the pitch key. Same rule. The quarterback is, after he gets past number one, his eyes are on number two. He's either going to pitch off number two or he's going to keep. It's very quarterback driven. This offense, if you don't have a quarterback who can run it, you will struggle greatly. And then number three, this is the guy that oftentimes causes you the biggest problems. I would say number three, and then also the backside inside linebacker cause the biggest problems for the inside player. Number three is the run support player. Most times you're going to see this is a strong side safety or an outside linebacker. This guy is being being blocked by our, by our play side A back. Play side A back wants to block him because this is the guy that is going to cover the pitch man if we pitch the ball. And we want if we pitch the ball, our pitch off of the triple option is normally our most explosive play. When I show you some highlights here in a little bit, you're going to understand what I mean when I say the pitch is our most explosive play. These are our concept rules for the inside veer. Not super complex. We try to keep it as simple as possible for our players. So instead of thinking, they can react. The play side receiver, his job is to block near deep defenders. Normally it's the corner. If we make a switch call, which would be if the corner is pressing or we have just an issue with with, um, how we've prepared uh, against an opponent, he's going to block that number three run support player. The play side A back, he's going to arc, which is an outside release for that number three, that run support player, unless we have a switch call, whereas he will block that cornerback. The play side tackle, this is the guy who is essential to the execution of this play. He's either going to veer inside, not blocking that defensive end. He's going to veer inside, to the inside linebacker or he'll loop, meaning take an outside release to the inside linebacker. The way we set it up for our tackle, it's his choice based on easiest release. So if he has a head up defensive lineman, he needs to choose based on who he's playing against. If it's a more athletic guy, he may want to take an inside release. If the guy's slower, he may take an outside release. Play side guard, really easy job here. Base head up to inside shade. If he has an outside shade, like a three technique, he would call for a combo block with our play side tackle. Now, most times we don't want to run the inside veer to a three technique. We usually want to run it to a shade, an even front, something like that. The three technique, you can, and you'll see in some of the clips we do. Um, It's just not as nice of a read for the quarterback, and we prefer to have more of an inside leverage player. The center, the backside guard, and the backside tackle, they are scooping to the play side, meaning they are dipping and ripping, and nothing crosses their face, and they're going to the second level. We don't believe that backside defensive linemen can make the play based on their speed and what we're doing, especially because we use counters, we use trap, we use things like that, that if they're coming straight up field, they're begging for something else to happen down the road. Our backside A is using tail motion. Now his aiming point is the butt of the B back, which is our full back. He's running to that aiming point. And then at the snap, he's in pitch phase. He needs to expect the ball every single time, even if he's not going to get it. 
Backside receiver, he's cutting the field in half, going to the deepest threat, which is normally the safety. Our B back, he's our full back. If you want to have success in the, in the flex bone triple option, you have to have a full back that is a hammer. Not necessarily big and imposing, but has to do his job to the best of his ability. He's on a B gap track at the play side cheek of that play side guard, and he needs to expect the ball every time. His shoulders need to be square. He needs to burst through the line. And we have a rule for our guys that they're not allowed to cut outside until they've reached that second level or the open field. Um, we've been blessed over the past four years to have a couple really, really good athletic running backs. Um, both of them didn't accumulate the number of yards to a lesser athlete who we just had. Um, and the reason for that was that guy was a train track runner as a B-back. He ran straight forwards, shoulder square, uh, more like a bulldozer. Wasn't going to run away from anybody, but he was explosive for those first five to six yards, and he did extremely well. The quarterback is the captain of the offense. This is the guy that runs it all. He's driving to the mesh. Now, our quarterback is a younger guy right now. You're going to see on it. Uh, he drives to the mesh very well. Uh, he actually hops to the mesh. I've seen some other guys step to the mesh. We hop just because we believe it's easier. His eyes are on number one. This comes with the reps. If you don't rep it, you're going to have issues with the mesh. If the defensive end is committing to the dive, the quarterback's going to pull and replace through that C-gap, and his eyes are on number two. If he doesn't, he's just going to give it to the fullback. We are 100% okay gaining three yards every single play if the defense gives it to us. We will dive them into misery. It's fine. But when they start jumping on that dive, that's when the big explosive plays happen. And then we go back to it, and it catches them again. If number two commits, we pitch to that backside A. A rule we have for our quarterbacks with the, court, the quarterback fullback mesh it's called pass the Peter. Uh, the way we have a rule with the mesh is when the quarterback passes midline, which would be his belly button, he needs to have a decision whether he's giving or keeping. We don't hang on too late because that's how fumbles happen. Uh, early on in this offense, we had a big problem with mesh turnovers. Uh, the biggest obstacle with that was the quarterback would second guess himself. We tell them when in doubt, give it. Give it to the fullback. At least we'll have a no yard gain and not lose yards. When the quarterback pulls it late, you're risking a fumble. You're risking a turnover. You're risking a tackle for a loss. Nothing really good is going to happen 80% of the time. Every so often, if your quarterback's a better athlete, you'll get away with it. This is how we block inside Veer. Uh, I have four different looks here. These are our most common defenses. The odd, now this could be a 3-4, or it could also be a 5-2. It really depends on what the defense is trying to do with it. The play side tackle, this would be inside veer to the right. He is not blocking that head up defensive line. Now, in this case, he's going to take an outside release. If you want to take an inside release, wouldn't be a problem. In reality, it comes down to, we think if he takes an outside release, that defensive end might follow him, uh, which would widen the seam for our fullback. Against a 4-4, he's taking an inside release. Most of the time, against an even front, you will see your play side tackle takes an inside release. It's just a more natural release path for your play side tackle. Backside, the scoop is extremely important. Uh, if your team is not effective with the, ex the backside scoop, you're going to see backside defensive tackle or backside linebacker specifically blowing this play up. Now it won't be for a loss most times. It'll only be for a gain of one or two, but our goal here is to score touchdowns, not just gain a couple yards. Sniper veer. Now with this, um, sniper is, it's an adjustment. This isn't a, a concrete set of what we do. What sniper is for us is when we're playing against a team and we've noticed that their defensive ends have been taught they want to have their hands on the tackles when they release because they've been taught don't ever let an offensive lineman release, which is in reality, it's a good 
rule to have, especially with screens and things like that. We'll call sniper. Now what sniper does is our place I tackle is pulling flat for the corner. Our A back is pinning inside. The play side A back is pinning inside for the inside linebacker. And your play side receiver is going to number three, just like he would if there was a switch call. What this does is it's going to widen the hole for the B back. So I would say 99% of the time when we call sniper, it's going to end up being a give for the B back just based off what the defense is going to do. This isn't something we do all the time. This is strictly situational. The great thing with this, it almost turns the play into an ISO, but it, the rules for the quarterback stay the same. So if the case would come where the defensive end would pinch and the number two would pinch, we can still pitch off of this. Instead of a little wide receiver blocking the corner, we now have a larger offensive lineman doing it. But sniper is something that's very effective, especially against a defense who has defensive ends who want to kind of hang on to your line. Now, I'm going to go to some clips here uh, that are going to show you uh, kind of what we do uh, in regards to the inside veer. Oh. Okay, so I'm going to start out here uh, with our give reads. Uh, this is what we want to do. Give reads are the simplest thing for our quarterback, and our rule for him is ba it's this. Is the fullback going to get tackled, yes or no? Now, with this look, this first play, which I wanted to pause here so you understand, this is a team we were playing against week four this past year. The week before, we had tremendous success running inside veer to the field. Now, the reason we had success with that was the team we were playing against let us do it. Our offensive foundation is it's very balanced. We can go left or right and still look exactly the same. This team decided their best way to defend our offense was to overload to the field. And if you count here from our center, which would be on the right hash over, there are seven guys to the field, which gives us four to the boundary. Our quarterback makes a great read here. He checks opposite to the boundary. Now we're still running. We're not blocking the stand-up defensive end because he's number one. The interesting thing with this look is there not, there's not even a number two based on their failed alignment. This is a give read, like I said, and you'll see why as we go. The defensive end here was playing quarterback the entire time. He came straight up field. Our B back was able to slip underneath and had a tremendous play. Another example of this here, this is actually the first year we were running it. Uh, you'll notice we have a, a different back here. He's much more explosive. However, he's running laterally significantly more. Now, a guy with his ability is going to get away with it. He's a better athlete. Physical superiority voids all theory. If you're hung up on your best athlete doing something that other guys can't do, you're going to have a problem down the road. You want it to be run successfully, but give your athletes an option in order to be the best they can be. Now, this next play here, let me pause it. Uh, this is, we were backed up at our own four yard line. Uh, this is early uh, 2018. We run inside fear. The defensive ends for this team we were playing, they're upfield guys. Now, is that disciplined? No. And this is why they pay for it here. This is a 96 yard touchdown run. Now the athlete carrying the ball does a lot of the work in the second level. Uh, the kid is phenomenal. He's actually a Division One college wrestler right now. Uh, phenomenal athlete for a young man, but it was set up for success. Later on, this is a different. Uh, this is his past year in 2019. This is our guy that's, that's a train track runner. We're basing it off of what the defense is giving us. This is a give read. Now, he got hands on our running back, but he wasn't going to tackle and this is a feeling out process you're going to see throughout with what we're doing because you want your team 
to find success in what they're doing based off of what the defense gives you. If they don't have a defensive end strong enough to arm tackle your fullback, you give it to the fullback all day. Our fullback broke our single game rushing record. He had 316 yards on about 30 carries against this team here in purple. Uh, you're going to see some clips up. That wasn't because he was some super running back. It was because the defense gave us that opportunity to execute at a higher level. And you will also notice a lot of these teams, it's team-based. The give reads are against the same types of teams. The pitch reads are against the same types of teams. It comes down to who you're playing and what they give you. It's another give read. Now, this isn't the same clip I showed you earlier. This young man actually had an opportunity to have two back-to-back 96-yard touchdowns. And unfortunately, he was a little tired, I think. It looks exactly the same based on what they gave us. Now, a great thing I have here is this is an offensive lineman running right next to him. So we have guys blocking down the field. As a coach, as a former offensive lineman myself, I love to see the big guys running downfield trying to make a play. This next one, this hits very quick. This is one of the best give reads I can show you. This is from that first year we were running the offense. Our running back was a phenomenal athlete. He's playing NAIA ball right now. He does extremely well. And he hits that seam about as fast as you could. The great thing about this, if your defensive end is so committed to getting the quarterback and you don't have somebody on that dive read, it's at the second level before somebody can see it. So if you watch here, uh, our guy's in motion. Let me back it up just a tad. So here he's in motion. You're going to see our back at the next level by the time the quarterback gets hit. And he's off. Okay, Young man's a phenomenal athlete, which is great. But the scheme itself set it up. This is another one here. We're running inside Veer to the field. This is actually one of our younger running backs. We're going to have this next year. Uh, he's, he's a shoulders over his knees runner, hard runner. Uh, does a great job getting downfield, but that's an eight yard game. Nothing fancy, it's nothing pretty, but what it does is it moves the chains, it kills the time of possession, it gives you that opportunity to have extreme success. Another give read here, and you're noticing our B back isn't getting touched, and it's not because they're making lots of jukes. What that is, is the defense gives it, the defense makes the choice. All our quarterback has to do is do what they did. This next one is a keep read. Now, the one thing I will say, these are our biggest highlights. Um, I have game film of give, read, give, read, give, read, and it's three yards, three yards, three yards, three yards. That works. That's extremely effective. But for the sake of time, I'm not going to show you every single one. Now, with our keep reads, a lot of times this is the second phase. The defense gets tired of seeing the fullback carrying the ball and they commit to that fullback. Well, they forget that the guy giving the ball to the fullback can also run the ball. So these are our keep reads. This one here, if you look, this defensive end, he sits and he commits to the fullback. As soon as he commits to that fullback, our quarterback pulls and replaces, and he's off to the running. Now, it helps if your quarterback is an athletic young man that can get downfield and when he gets in open space can have extreme success. Here's another look at it. This quarterback you see here, he's our current quarterback. He started every snap since he was a freshman and he was a sophomore in 2019. Now going into his junior year, he's got an extreme amount of experience. Uh, very, very talented young man, gonna do great things. All right, so another one here, uh, keeping this one I love because you're going to see our quarterback fake a pitch and, and keep the ball. And the defensive end, it show, or this is actually outside linebacker, sorry, uh, he doesn't know what to do. This is a situation where we've been running this play concept all game, and it's very frustrating for the defense. So you're actually going to see the defensive player freeze and look at a guy who's not getting the ball. And our quarterback does a great job getting up field and having a successful play after that. The, the give read, a lot of times 
you're going to have an explosive opportunity based on what the defense has given you. Uh, you know, this one here, I believe, this is actually a misread by our quarterback, but I wanted to show it anyhow because it gives you kind of a, a clip of the bind it puts the defense in. Now, our quarterback here should have pitched it. This actually was a better pitch read than what he had. But based on what we were doing, the quarterback viewed he could still get in the end zone. This is third and seven, okay, on the seven-yard line. Quarterback, we have great motion. And in this case here, you have one man on defense having to account for both the quarterback and the pitch key. Now, if he would have pitched it, our A-back would have walked into the end. In this case, uh, the, the defensive player makes an arm tackle attempt and is unsuccessful. However, uh, a lot of it's based on he's not in good tackling position for this. And our quarterback was able to get into the end. Zone. Another one here, right before we switch over to the pitch reads, you'll notice a lot of times in the open field, we get those cutbacks. That is because we flow so hard to the play side, you get a lot of opportunity for a big, big explosive play at the end. All right, so pitch reads, uh, these are our big explosive plays. Uh, when we pitch the ball, we're expecting it to either be a touchdown or a huge explosive play based on the defense gave us that opportunity. Now, as I start out here in this first pitch read I give you, uh, this is against one of the best teams in our league. Uh, and what they give us, this is a 5-2 look. They pinch their defensive ends to tackle the quarterback and their interior defensive linemen are tackling the dive. So they're forcing the pitch. We are able to have success running the ball against this team based on the rules of this offense. It, the pitch is quick. Our quarterback takes a little bit of a shot, but what we teach our quarterback is when they pitch, they're not falling into the tackle. They're actually pitching, pitching and push away because they don't need to absorb a, absorb a bunch of contact as they're going. So they take the dive, coming for the quarterback, nice easy pitch. And we're gaining about 9 to 15 yards here just on a simple triple option pitch. This is early on. This is actually one of the first chances this quarterback had where he started actually pitching the ball. This is our dive key. You see eyes on the fullback, and our quarterback pulls it, and he's going to pitch. Once they make the play on him, he gives a nice 11-yard gain easy play here this is another one and these a backs that are having these big plays here they're not explosive young men they're not four four forty guys that's why a lot of times you're going to see them getting caught from behind that's not a knock on our guys what it is is the system itself has built in opportunities for them to be successful this next play our formation changes this is our tight formation we bring our wide receivers in which gives an extended uh, line for the defense. It also forces corners to try to play as a run support player. Quarterback does a great job pulling and then pitching, which gives a seam and the edge to our guy running the ball. Here's another one. This is down at the goal line. Triple option is a great concept of the goal line, especially the defense commits so hard to stopping the dive. This is, again, one of those teams that they pinch on the defensive ends. Our A-back is our second leading rusher on the team, not because of carries. It's because every time our A-back touches the ball, we expect it to go for 10 yards plus every single time. Uh, the, the way I break up our, our offense success-wise, our fullback led the team in rushing. He had about 1,400 yards, and then our A-back had about 800 yards, and then our quarterback had about 700 yards, and that's not counting receiving and passing yards as well. This is another play here. Uh, the great thing I love about this is you're going to see our offensive line executing very, very well at getting to the next level to block the linebackers. I'll bring it back here just real quick. Huddle's freezing on. Oh, there we go. The dive, the pitch, and our A-back does a great job blocking that outside linebacker, which was number three. Moving forward here, this is a team 
Uh, they struggled greatly stopping the dive. And when they finally committed to stopping the dive, it gave us that pitch option. This is another one, and this is that team I told you that our, our fullback had a huge game. Well, eventually you're going to try to stop the offense from doing what it's doing. This is why that inside veer offense is so effective because once they decide they're tired of seeing the beat back carry the ball and they don't want to see the quarterback, they're going to forget about someone. We purposely don't block people, so we have a numbers advantage to the play side. And this, this corner makes the mistake of diving inside for the inside veer. Our A back is catching a pitch and he has all this beautiful grass to run on without any resistance whatsoever. Now, he's not a fast young man, but he's fast enough to where he's gonna get in the end zone before anybody does anything. Bring that back, here we go. So they commit to the dive, this corner, he sucks inside. We have the pitch and our A back is off and running here. Uh, and he's able to get into the end zone untouched. It's not the kids, it's the system. Now, having better athletes is going to make your system run extremely really efficient. Um, the great thing about this, if you're undersized, if you're not physically ready to where you should be, it's going to make you better. Uh, I got a couple more here. All right, this next one here, uh, we're in the red zone. The defense commits. Another situation where your A back is getting to that next level without being touched. Now, in that case, our wide receivers didn't quite do a good enough job blocking the corners. Uh, if you look at our biggest struggle uh, on the perimeter blocking wise, our wide receivers and A backs struggled at times to block on the perimeter. That's something we're getting better at over the past three years. However, it's something usually your corner doesn't want to take on a fullback. So if you can ever force that corner to be a run support player, it's great. It's a wonderful day. Got a, a few more here. This is a great view of our A-back getting, just hitting that seam. It's nothing fancy. He's not making a lot of cuts. This is our favorite one of the year, uh, just based on our A-back is catching the pitch and he's gone as soon as he catches it. The great thing with this, this team committed so hard to stopping our quarterback and our fullback that our A-back had the opportunity to have a very, very good play. This is third and five, right around there, third and four, third and five. So no matter where you are on the field, this offense is effective. This is all one play concept. It looks three different ways. It's the same play. So game planning for me, it's great. First and 10, second and five, second and 12, third and two, third and eight, you can run this offense and be an efficient and effective offense. So this one here, you'll see is right up the sidelines, it's to the boundary. You don't necessarily have to commit to only running it to the field. Um, the, the corner here took himself out of the play because he was more focused on the wide receiver than actually stopping the run concept. And then he got caught out of position. Okay, and then that wraps up my clips I had for you. I do want to thank you uh, for your time. Once again, I'm Jeff Richards at Bluffton High School in Bluffton, Ohio. If you have questions for me about the Flexbow and Triple Option offense, need me to clarify something or want to pick my brain about anything, email is probably the best way to reach me. Uh, it's richardsj at bluftonschools.org. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Jeff Richards BHS. Uh, thank you for your time. Thanks again to Coach Banstra. Uh, this is an amazing setup here. It gives coaches an opportunity to share and learn from each other.